Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are advised that this program contains images and voices of people who have died. Hello, I'm Robert Connolly. Tonight's program is about a friend of mine, a film and television actor I was very lucky to direct in the film Balibo and the TV show Barracuda. But now Damon Gamow is playing a very different role. After making a film about sugar, he's hooked up with a community in Central Australia that's tackling health problems. And now, in his new role as a film director, he's helping to make a difference. This is his story. The Australian Outback is the last true cathedral on Earth. You are just in this enormous expanse and there's something quite spiritual about that, I think. We should probably just do some testing of what foods are going to work and be popular. Where we're going to in, in Pipuljara, that's maybe 800 k's southwest of, of Alice, so it's, it's a long way inland. The first time I went out there, I found it really overwhelming. I, I felt that I didn't belong there. And I still get a sense of that when I go to the APY lands, that you do feel honoured to be allowed to be there because it is a, a very strictly, tightly controlled Aboriginal space. When Damon was very young, he did the tracker with David Goldplill and they had a really close connection. God respect Aboriginal law as much as you respect white fellas law. Maybe more. First time I'd ever met an Aboriginal man and was just completely captivated with him and his stories. Them black fellas probably cooked him and ate him. You know, we're all cannibals. But they don't know the pain in me. <laughs> to go and spend time with him and live with his family and live off the land and hunt. It was just a complete, I was only 23 and it blew my mind because I'd never experienced something like that. But I felt the magic of that and the simplicity of it and that it just made me feel different. But there was an element when I'd seen how much coke people were consuming and that kind of really shocked me. And that image stayed with him and little did he know at the time how pertinent it would be to his unfolding story around sugar down the track. It's not just saying fizzy drinks are bad, drink water, but understanding why water is important, especially in regards to kidneys and type 2 diabetes and whatnot. People in the APY lands I think live, uh, their average life expects about 55 years, so it's 20 years less than what we do. <laughs> This is a dry community, there's no alcohol here, it hasn't been there for 40 years. So all these diseases we're seeing there are predominantly diet related. Hello? Howdy. We made it. Hey, how are you? JT. Hey. John Tregenz is one of those people that I, you know, I feel very, very fortunate to meet. Yeah, it was. In the last 35 years, he's seen the health deteriorate and that would be very hard to watch. So that's what drives him, I think, to keep going and trying to try and make a difference. And how's Same everything here? Go. All going well? Yeah, yeah. Kelly's been busy. I've been sort of going around spreading the news, Everyone's prepping everything. Damon discussed with me what we might be able to do right. in tackling these chronic illness problems. Some people are Myself to... and Kelly and Fiona, the two nutritionists, really yeah, want to help out. Can... Getting some smoothies and eggs and stuff going. Yeah, well, there's a few different people here this time. So I think one of the important things that has really helped is the fact that they're volunteers, because um, I think will relate to the fact that people come out here out of their own goodwill to try and do something to help them. For me, it's like, can't we at least give these people healthy, nutritious food, you know? And I guess that's the driving motivation for doing what, what we're doing at the moment. Some, um, do you want some of that? When I met Zoe, self-care wasn't high on the list. I was still enjoying a packet of cigs a day and a couple of Cokes. I was aware of eating 
you know, healthful foods. When Damon came into the picture, I think he was he was curious. Hope Cheers. Right. Thanks See so ya. Much. Bye. We met in Timor in a place called One More Bar. I was over there shooting a documentary and Damon came over for Balibo. The buildings here are deserted. We spoke to one soldier today who believes that a potion given to him by his family. And I remember thinking, wow, he's handsome, he's intelligent, he's charming, and doesn't he know it? <laughs> and I just, yeah, every cliche in the book, I just, I was like, oh, wow, that's the girl I'm probably going to be with for the rest of my life. I just had one of those things. Damon was very much in that acting world. When you're part of that scene, you're inclined to go out, get a bit drunk, or <laughs> have a good time. <laughs> but I knew, like, as soon as I met her, I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to change some things in my life. She is the one, but I've got some work to do. Can I use that one? Uh, yeah. I hadn't been drinking for quite some time, and he'd been dabbling with the idea of not drinking, oh. and that sort of bonded us in a small way. We kind of both liked the lucidity of our relationship. And you cut open and all the cheese should come out, huh? It was tough early on because I was so used to sweet things that I was like sitting at dinner going, yeah. give me some salt or sweetness for God's sake. Smother this in barbecue sauce. You want to cut daddy's out a bit more? But I got to a point where I started going, wow, I feel different. I'm sleeping like I've never slept before. And people keep commenting on my, on my eyes and my skin and I've lost some weight. And, What's going on here? And I started seeing some articles about sugar and I thought, wow, well, I know my experience from that is quite real. So I wonder, and then it kind of all snowballed from there. My name is Damon Gamo. Having been an actor, it was an inevitable transition for him to be making films eventually. Sugar has become so prevalent in today's society that if you removed all the items containing it from a standard supermarket's shelves, just 20% of items would remain. Is it too cold? <laughs> Here, Daddy will warm it up it's first too with cold his bum. To sit. <laughs> there was a few stats that were quite motivating to me, and, and one was that type 2 diabetes now kills someone every six seconds around the world. And this is a disease that's preventable by diet. Um, the fact that one in four Aussie kids now are overweight or obese. How much for your carrot? Two. Two? And so we're okay. seeing for the first time in history children two. get type 2 diabetes. Uh, excuse me, do you have any baby chinos? Uh, no, I oh, You've run, run out. out. Okay. Oh, okay. From my perspective, I didn't want this to happen with my child. I have to go. Okay. And there's so much debate and conjecture on the topic that it's hard to know what to believe. The only real way to get some answers is for me to start eating sugar again and see what it does to my body. When he was gearing up so to first, yeah. shoot and make the sugar film, he was almost in perfect physical condition to do such an experiment on himself because he had very little refined food already in his diet. So here are the rules for my next 60 days. I must consume 40 teaspoons of sugar a day. I was thinking about how to tell the narrative. How do you tell this story? And I picked up a can of tomato soup and I saw that it had seven teaspoons of sugar in it. And this was just like a one serve tomato soup. And I thought, I don't reckon many people would know that there's almost as much sugar in that as a can of Coke, you know, and yet this is really perceived as a healthy, savoury meal. Right, so this just right tells me that it's 12 grams of sugar per serving. So that's really how, how it started. And I thought, I wonder if I could eat what most Australians are eating every day, but actually do it through the foods they're not aware of. That's a recommended serving size with three teaspoons of sugar. Because we did the experiment where I didn't have any chocolates or ice cream or lollies or, you know, I was only eating perceived healthy foods. I genuinely didn't think or know that we'd get any effect. The fact that things started happening to me so quickly and my body started deteriorating very quickly, um, we probably could have stopped the experiment after 30 days. After 60 days and 2,360 teaspoons of sugar, I gained 8.5 kilograms overall. By the end, I'd developed pre-type 2 diabetes. I had um, heart disease. I had 11 centimetres of visceral fat, which is the fat on the inside of your body that is the more toxic, dangerous fat. Mine jumped from 20 below the safety line to 20 above the safety line. 
The big one was the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease was almost in a, a full-blown state where if it goes much further, you, you know, it starts to harden, you get the cirrhosis of the liver. The speed at which my high sugar diet was affecting me took us all by surprise. I was going to have to expand the scope of the experiment and this would take me out of town for a few days. Just 100 kilometres from Uluru is the small town of Amata. One of the things that was always important to me was I thought I don't want to just make a film. But in 2007, its population of just under 400 people consumed 40,000 litres of soft drink. Part of me was, what's, what are the next steps? Like, how do you actually impact change? I just found this story about this town, Armata and the APY lands, where the elders had got together and decided to remove full strength Coca-Cola. And I just went, wow, that's, that, that needs to be told. Everything that happens here, it's all Aboriginal voted money. When Damon approached me, he said he was making a film, and he asked if it was possible to come onto the land to sort of um, argue the case of reducing people's sugar consumption. Um, I was fairly wary. I undertook to help Damon on the basis that he would give something back. He just can't come onto these lands and make a film and go away. Um, without what we call ngapadi ngapadi, what's the, what's what are you going to give back in return for this favour? And he said that um, if the film was a success, he would set up a foundation to assist these people to understand the sugar message. So one Aboriginal man decided to do something about it. His name is John Dragenza. This is his case. This is his puturu, and this is his nickname. Why? Because I cut through the bullshit. John Tregenza was a social worker at Armata. He saw the effect the reserve was having on the Pitantindyara. When they asked him to come here as community advisor, he agreed. Yeah, I arrived on these lands in the early 70s, and at that time, most of the diet was coming from the bush and only supplemented from the store. John Tregenza understands the Pitantindyara because he is a man in their terms, that is, an initiated man. Life was good a um, long time. And there was um, no store, no houses, long time. They were like a warrior, you know, and feed their families in the bush. These little communities have sprung out of these people's desire to get away from settlements and missions with all of the social problems that those places create. Back in the 70s, people were probably sourcing 90% of their food from, from the bush and about 10% from the store. Now, that's changed over the last 30, 40 years to being pretty much round the other way. In fact, it's probably more like 95% out of the store and about 5% um, out of the bush. They lost access to bush tucker. People used to live a lot off rabbits. Khaleesi rice wiped out the rabbits. The uh, Port Arthur massacre and the response from the Australian government to that essentially disarmed the men. So once we're hunters, can now only point their finger at game. They don't have the weaponry to go out and hunt, apart from the fact that, of course, um, the game is scarcer because of the buffalo and the camels. Oh, look at that. Wow. What, what we've got now is a changed environment. See, that, that's native grass, sap, that. um, But uh, that there's buffalo. And the rest of the plain, as you go out there, it's choked with buffalo. The problem is that um, not only don't roos and big game eat it, um, it's all also very hard for the predators, the birds and others to find their feed. So it just doesn't only impact on the, the big game, it impacts on this whole food chain. In the early 90s, the defunding of the homelands forced people to come into the larger settlements. And with that event, the reliance on the store became stronger. All the stores um, were operating with non-Aboriginal managers and the prices were outrageous and the products were terrible. In those days, it was basically the store manager became responsible for the nutrition of the community. 
people were having tons of sugar added to their normal diet. Sugar came, so people, they had a taste. Hey, this is beautiful taste, sweet. I might get one for my children. We did now, but we thought it was a good, like sugar, instead of eating um, fruits and veggies. Insulin resistance syndrome increased, obesity increased, and diabetes, type 2 diabetes. All of the health problems, including diabetes and kidney failure, is all related to the diet. I've known almost everyone buried here. I've got family members buried here. Most of these, um, these deaths here are premature and could have been avoided um, with correct diet and access to affordable, healthy food. It's a complete tragedy. We formed an Aboriginal Anangal Steering Committee to have a look at the whole problem. John, with the local committees there, formed a group called Maywiru, which meant good food. They would operate the stores with good food, good education, and try and restore the health of the local people. I was the first general manager of the Maywiru stores policy. We were funded at that stage through the Department of Health and Ageing, and we had in-house a nutritionist. The original intention of Maywiru was that stores should be seen as an essential service. They're the only source of food and nutrition in the community, and they should be allowed to be not-for-profit. The Maywiru itself, the, the, the stores group, makes up of five stores now. Maywuru, it's up to the community and other community too. So everybody like it, oh yeah. We might try and put out something. I think that's a good idea. Maywuru, it's good. Maywuru was working. And in a very short time, Armata had the lowest rate of sugar consumption in the region. So things were going along in that way until the federal Labor government decided that the Maywiru group no longer was to be funded under the health budget and that we became the responsibility of essentially the Aboriginal Affairs Department of the Commonwealth Government. The stores were told that they had to be economically viable in their own right. They have a great word, Pindara, Tungan Pungani. We're stubborn. We're just going to keep going, you know. We got there over two years and um, developed the Maywiru Stores policy, and we certainly improved on lots of the retail structures within the stores. So they're very well-run stores, they're very efficient, they've got good managers. There's no government funding comes into Maywiru at all. So that's weaned ourselves off that, which is good. We've now run uh, a weekly service. So from the Adelaide markets, we're getting fresher fruit and veg into the lands quicker than what people in Alice Springs is getting it. But in this whole process, whilst everything's fine commercially, there are still huge amounts of sugar being consumed and the emphasis on health has sort of been lost on the way. When they lost the funding from the Department of Health, that also meant they lost the funding for a nutritionist. And that's been difficult to sustain a nutrition focus because you also need somebody who's dedicated to looking and monitoring the, the nutrition of the store. What people are consuming here is not a lot different to what people are consuming mm -hmm. everywhere else. The difference with here is there's one store they try to provide as much choice as possible in that store, but there's a lot of other factors producing chronic health effects a lot quicker. There's a lot of sugar consumed by children. It's not as clear-cut as it would be maybe in a city. One statistic that we found out about today, only today, was that there's 100 kilos of raw sugar sold a week in PIP for about 150 people. So we have some work to do. And the actor award goes to that sugar film, Nick Batsius and Damon Gamow. Thank you very, very much. Um, 
So many people to thank. It, it is the highest grossing Australian about, documentary about of all time now. So here's the documentaries. Because of the success of the film and the attention that it gave Mayuru, we were able to um, establish the foundation, which has raised about $100,000 so far and, and made it possible for nutritionists to return to the APY lands um, with an education program around added sugar. Today, part of the deal of getting a meal is also that you get a free movie screening thrown in. So uh, we're going to serve the dinner after showing. We've got an Aboriginal version of the sugar film, just to get everyone on board with what we're trying to do. Given the level of funding that the foundation had, I considered it was best to um, start in one community. Pibuljara was seen as a good place to start. The store is in quite a good state. It's a smaller community. John Tregenza has good relationships with people in that community, so it was just chosen as a pilot, really. It can create subconscious or mindless habits, which are easily triggered by more images of sugary foods. I have family and friends out here, and it's where I've lived for many years. It's a lot more comfortable out here to introduce something new and to talk to people about it. Yeah, because it says honey, but that really means sugar. So that's really what the foundation was about, and, and to teaming up with John again was to try and help reinvigorate that aspect and provide the nutritionist and employ that nutritionist that, 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 that they couldn't afford anymore. So that's really what we're trying to do. So this, we have sugar, 6.7 grams per 100 ml. Uh, things are quite embryonic at the moment, we're just sort of beginning, but one of the first things we're focusing on is just the store itself, so we're going around um, sort of educating the local people as well to understand what we're trying to do about putting clearer labelling on the foods to make sure we're aware of the foods that have got added sugar in. Even though it says 30% less sugar, there's still too much sugar in this, there's a lot of sugar. In an ideal world, it would be lovely just to take everything off the shelf and just put <laughs> everything that you want in there as a nutritionist but it takes time to change. It was just fantastic having Damon and, and Kelly and Fiona. We had no idea how much sugar was in some of this stuff. And they just came and said, look, how about coming in and um, putting some labels up in the store about the thumbs up, thumbs down, helping people make those choices. The key is to try and get sort of familiar foods that are, are comfort foods, but they're sort of we use slightly different ingredients. Yeah. Lots of colours so we get all the vitamins and the nutrients in there. Did you know that um, your mum and I and Fiona worked together last time with you? Yeah. yeah. We had a few of those children come in and help us. They've all done cooking before. Cooking's a big thing out here. I want to be a um, chef when I get out of You're going to be a chef? Yes. Yeah. Keenan, who's my little helper all day, he wants to be a chef, which is <laughs> music to my ears. A healthy chef, hopefully. <laughs> Have your friends been eating less sugar? Yeah. The thing that I say in community meetings all the time is that the reason we're doing this is so that the young children now, our grandchildren now, do not end up going down the same track of diabetes, kidney failure, dialysis machines and early death, which is um, the track that many, many people out here are on now. future. We have to look forward for our children to go forward and stay healthy and live longer. There's one thing that we can have a pretty quick impact on, which is providing healthy cooked meals. Everything that we've prepared has been eaten quickly and consumed and people have asked for more. That is a success that's successful. The feedback we're getting as well is 100% positive. Yeah, it felt like yesterday went pretty well. Yeah, yeah, the, um, a lot of the women and the men too uh, commented on how good the food was. Yes. Not notwithstanding it had no sugar and salt. 
way back, I think even on, on um, Captain Cook's boat. There was an exchange of sugar for dancing. That's how it first began. When they landed on the shores, the Aboriginals did a performance and a dance and they gave them bags of sugar. And you know, it even started way back then. This trip's really shown us that what the people are asking for is the opportunity um, to have a variety of food that's cooked for them and presented to them every day. I reckon given the success of the cook-up yesterday, it feels like just go all out for the cafe We would actually bring in the chefs, cook the food and prepare it for people and hopefully see more and more lines um, snaking out the door. So if you've got an alternative, they'll go for it, as they said last night. John's been out there for so many years. He's heard all the stories. He's, you know, he's seen lots of initiatives like ours come through and not sort of uh, see any success. But I think he does believe in what we're, we're doing. We are trying to do things a little bit differently, and especially this, this cafe idea. I think that's uh, that's something that's exciting everybody. John and I, however, needed to add some salt, <laughs> but that's not the point. <laughs> Salt's good for it. In moderation. I wrote a song about Chuka in Pijinjar language. Sukakura, Sukakura tai pire kongu pei. Sukakura. Sukakura ta biri kungu pe Uwan gara kun po nyinama Uwan gara kun po nyinama Wari jura Minma jura Chichi jura kulila